on this edition of Great Lakes Now, sailing on ice. That was the most fun thing I've ever done. I don't know why anyone sails in normal water. This is the most fun sailing on Earth. Winter surfing on Lake Ontario. Conditions were really fun. It's like a perfect winter session and it's really enchanting. And news from around the lakes. Lake Trout has been on life support in Lake Michigan for many years. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. The Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. The Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at DPTV. The Polk Family Fund, Eve and Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, Founders Brewing Company, and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ward Duttweiler. Welcome back to Great Lakes Now. You've seen people sailing on the lakes in the summertime, but have you ever seen anyone ice boating in the winter? The sport has deep roots in the Great Lakes region, and not long ago, I got a chance to try it. I've been sailing on the Great Lakes my whole life, but there's one kind of sailing I've never done. It's called ice boating, and instead of sailing through the water, you race across the ice on blades. The mechanics are basically the same, but it looks fast and fun. Ron Sherry is the most accomplished ice boat racer in the world, and he calls the Great Lakes home. He's won every title and earned every accolade. At last count, he was the five-time world champion in his class, 14-time North American champion, and eight-time ice boat world champion title holder. Oh, and he's also an award-winning summer sailor. Ron promised to get me out on the ice, but first, I wanted to visit his workshop to learn more about the sport and the ice boats. Because Ron doesn't just race them, he builds them. Hey, Ron. Good to Ward. see you. Good to see you. So I'm, I'm so excited to be here. I've been wanting to check this out forever and this, check out the sport forever. Uh, tell us where we are and, and what you do here. Uh, well, we're in uh, the Composite Concepts shop, and this is where all the magic happens. Uh, I build uh, the best, most fun toys in the world, which you're going to get to see today. It's going to be great to see the grin on your face when we uh, come off the ice. Uh, um, build a few lodges here. Um, that's the hall. It's what you actually sit in. We make them out of Sitka spruce with the Okumi mahogany decks, all minimum thickness, so they're as light as possible. There's minimum weights on all the components, the mast, the plank, and the hull, so we try to get them as close to minimum weight as possible. And um, that's uh, how we do it here. I noticed, rather than calling it a hull, you call it a fuselage. Yes. Is using the, the airplane terminology like an indication of how fast these things can go? Yeah, I mean, in, in Finland, the one year I got clocked at 143 kilometers an hour, which is like 94 miles an hour. There was uh, five kilometers between the marks when we raced, and it was the 98, and I won my first world championships there, and they had a gun out there, a speed gun, and crazy breakneck speed, you know? But don't worry, you don't have to go that fast unless you want to. But you can. <laughs> Ron races a class of boats called the DN class. DN stands for Detroit News, the legendary newspaper for the city of Detroit. In 1936, the paper held a contest to come up with a design for an affordable, easy to build ice boat. Over the years, you know, they came up with specifications. We're still using basically the same rules with some small modifications. And it's uh, still using a lot of the basic rules as it all started out with. And it's the biggest class in the world. I mean, there's a lot of great ice boats, but the DN class has the most participation. It's, it's huge in Europe. How many boats do you make in a year? About six to 10, depending on the year. Fuselages. Yeah. I've built over a thousand, like probably 1,100 masts now for the boats. Wow. I've built uh, around 250, 300 hulls. <laughs> I don't know how many planks. And I build about yeah, 150 runners a year. A passion for ice boating runs in the family. 
Ron's dad was a three-time world champion in a class of boats called Renegades. Ron won his first ice boat race when he was nine, so Ron got all three of his kids racing when they were very young. His son Griffin has ranked as high as fifth in the world. And the sport has taken Ron to beautiful frozen locations all over the world. We went out and raced uh, in Montana two years ago for the North American Championships, and that was so much fun, oh my gosh. And I've been to Siberia and raced on Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal is a 5,600 foot deep freshwater lake. D and ice boats have to meet certain standards in size and weight. These boats are minimum length because of trying to make the boat as light as possible. It actually has a crown in the bottom of it. It goes up three quarters of an inch under the mast step where the mast goes on top of the hull. So if you actually look down the table, you can see that. So like this boat has a very long cockpit, which is really good for a guy like you. So I decided to test it out. <laughs> oh, this is a tight fit in here. Oh, surprise. I'm actually surprised I can lay down in this thing. Yeah. But. And the, right you'll have a helmet on, and there's a piece and of I'm foam just... behind the seat back, and you're able to kind of put your helmet right on the and seat So when back. you're sailing, you're just laying in this little box. Yeah, it's kind of a little bit like a luge. Just and trying then, to be. And then when you really get going, so you'll steer with your knees. There'll be a tiller that you'll be able to steer with your knees. And then you'll sheet with both hands. And just and you yank can as just, hard as I can. And, and you're going to pull the sheet and have use the sheet to hold the tiller between your knees so it doesn't pop out. I'm just imagining myself right now just going like 60 miles an hour just right on the ice. Yeah, with the ice right here. Yeah. <laughs> the good news is, go like it. I said, the boats only weigh 46 um, pounds, so there's not wow. a lot of inertia. Like if you hit something, it just crumbles and you go sliding across the ice, you know? You got a Wait, helmet a, on and a race Is that supposed suit. to be a good thing or a bad yeah, thing? Yeah, it's, it's, that, you're that not, doesn't sound you're like gonna it's a be good safe. thing. You're gonna be safe. I'm feeling excited and I wanna go out in the lake. This is awesome. Well, let's go. Let's go, let's go sailing. <laughs> Finding the best ice for racing is always a challenge. The surface needs to be relatively smooth and without a lot of snow. On this day, the best conditions were on Wald Lake in suburban Detroit, where a group of racers had been coming to practice for U.S. Nationals. Last weekend, we had people from Boston, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Traverse City, down in Indiana, Ohio. I mean, everybody came to Wald Lake because it was in great conditions. We had 30 boats out on Friday and 50 boats out on Saturday. And it was a lot of the very best of the best of the U.S. were out there. It was fantastic. It's going. We're almost there. We're going to get him going here quick. We're almost there. Unloading the gear and putting the boat together is tough with frozen fingers. Once it was all together, Ron had some last minute instructions. So when you go to start, you, you see you pull the tiller back and when you twist it, it kind of stays, okay. okay? If you leave it straight forward, now when you run off, it's gonna go like that and you're gonna put a little torque on A little on twist, it. right? Trim the sheet into where you want it. Put it, I put the tiller like this, I put the sheet over the tiller. That way if the wind shifts, you get a big lift and it starts to try to hike, you can just lift up your thumb okay. and the sail goes out, okay? And then you hold it like this, push off. <laughs> Outside foot on, slide with the inside foot, and sheet on. Cool. And then when you get going, you just you move this tiller to where you can easily turn with your knees, remember? Yeah. And you hold the main sheet over top of it. If the boat doesn't even do anything like this, you got the tiller between your knees, it's gonna keep the boat going basically straight. So if you can't steer, more sheet. If the back end's loose, breaking loose, ease. Do you sort of get forward a little bit? A little bit, you can around, bend your knees. And, that. Yep. And that's all of it, and that's a lot to remember in a short period of time, but, but I think you'll have it. So it seems Ron thought I was ready, but there's only one way to find out. After some practice, I started to get the hang of it. Oh wow, every part of my body feels so weird right now. That was like the most fun thing I've ever done. I've been sailing my whole life since I was, literally since I was born, I don't know why anyone sails in normal water. 
This is the most fun sailing on earth. It is so amazing. You're going so fast. This is the sound. It's it's odd because it's it's really loud, but it's almost like dead quiet at the same time. It's really cool. Yeah, I think I won. By a little bit. Yeah, I kind of realized that midway through. I'm like, ah, we're ripping. <laughs> that was so awesome. <laughs> oh man, I'm gonna buy one of these. These are awesome. <laughs> like legitimately. Once I got started, I was blown away with how quickly the boat took off and surprised with how much it was like the sailing I had grown up doing. And actually, maybe even a little better. Like I had, I just got going so fast at one point, I like freaked out. I was like, oh my God, let go of everything. Like, <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. This is just amazing. So cool. <laughs> you have to understand that ice boating is inherently dangerous. You're going out on a frozen lake. There can be flaws in the ice. There can be ice fishing holes. So there's a certain amount of adrenaline just getting out there. You're down right next to the ice. You're going a million miles an hour, and it feels faster than it actually is just because of how close you are to the ice. So it was one more race. This time, it was just me and the master. On your mark, get set, go! The most important thing about Ice Boat is the camaraderie, is the friendships, the people you meet. And the people that are involved in the sailing, have been involved with the sailing, are a very unique group of individuals who are out in Mother Nature, battling Mother Nature, battling ice, snow, wind, cold, the whole thing, and trying to get prepared as they can to go out and do it. Think surfing, and you probably picture Hawaii or the California coast. But you can surf the Great Lakes, too. Today, we bring you the story of the Lake Surfistas. Oshawa, Ontario native Robin Peking learned to surf while on vacation in Hawaii. It wasn't until she returned home that she discovered she could surf right outside her door on the waters of Lake Ontario. As she tried out various Great Lakes shorelines, Peking started making friends among the women she met, many of whom were just as taken with the sport as she was. In 2014, she helped found Lake Surfistas. The Lake Surfistas is a group of women who surf and stand up paddleboard the Great Lakes. It has just over a thousand members, largely Canadians, but also with a handful in the US. Most of their surfing happens in the fall and winter when winds create the best conditions. My first surf of the new year, uh, conditions were really fun. Like it was some clean rides, some good drops had a really long couple of waves that just took me from way out to outside all the way in. Um, you know, it's cold out, but it's not like super, super cold. It's like a perfect winter session. And with this like light snow, it, it's really enchanting. On this January day, Robin and the surfistas are riding Lake Ontario on a beach east of Toronto where waves can get as high as eight feet. The Great Lakes can present challenges that nobody on the North Shore of Oahu has to contend with. One of the things that we kind of um, pay attention to, especially in the winter, is ice cover. So if there's a lot of ice chunks or it's, the shoreline is super ice, that's when it can get a little bit uh, dicey because um, the icy conditions are very dynamic and it can be quite dangerous. Today, the water is around 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Although here in Canada, that's about four degrees Celsius. However you say it, it's cold. So you definitely need a winter wetsuit. Right now I'm wearing a four and a half millimeter wetsuit, uh, five millimeter uh, gloves and seven millimeter boots. So typical stuff for winter. You can go a little bit warmer than this. Robin likes to bring a buddy in case she gets into trouble. Today, there is a small group of surfers keeping an eye on each other. Jordana Belliel is one of them. She's a Toronto surfing instructor. Out on the water we have Robin, um, who's one of the original Great Lake surfers. She's kind of the reason why so many women are out there surfing, because she's been doing it for like, I don't know, maybe 10 years, maybe more. Uh, Maddie LeBlanc is out with us today. She is one of the best uh, sup racers in Canada, and she's an awesome sup surfer, so it's great to have her out too. And we've got a couple of surfers from Surf the Greats. Uh, it's a local surf shop here in Toronto. Um, and just like a lot of cool people out. It's just about community. It's about Stoke. Um, 
like you know, like you said, not a lot of people do the sport or get out there. So the few people that get out there, we know each other, and you just become a community. You become family out in the water. That sense of family extends to the summer months when the surfing is less predictable. Once the warm weather comes, the winds die down, and the waves are generally not as big. Jen Zacado joined the Lake Surfistas a couple years ago after learning how to surf in the Dominican Republic. Making the switch to lake surfing required some adaptations. It can be very interesting. It's definitely different than ocean surf. So with the ocean, uh, the water is a lot more buoyant um, and a lot more powerful sometimes. Uh, the lakes is hit and miss. Uh, you have to look at the weather and the forecasting days ahead. And then sometimes the weather doesn't even work out and there are no waves, even when you think there will be. Um, so it can be frustrating, but then uh, when the weather does work out and there are waves, it's extremely magical and just a really great experience. Everybody here um, is a lot of fun in the water. I find uh, the culture is really awesome. Um, ocean surfing is a little bit of a different culture. Here everybody's just having so much fun and so friendly in the water because we just take whatever waves we can get and have the best time with what we have. Friendliness is what the lake surfistas are all about because other groups can be less welcoming to new surfers, especially if they're women. It's important that groups like lake surfistas exist because women really need a good entry point into surfing. I find that often um, the surf scene isn't that friendly sometimes. Um, for example, on Facebook, there's a lot of open lake surfing groups. So if you're a new person and you ask a question on one of these open groups, sometimes there's trolling, sometimes there's a lot of ego. Um, it's not always friendly. So Lake Surfistas was kind of born out of the necessity to welcome women who want to surf into this community in a safer way. So we actually have a Facebook group where it's only open to women. And we find that women in general tend to be a little bit more supportive of each other, a little bit more championing, um, encouraging, and kind of, you can do this. Many members feel strongly about the environment. So Lake Surfistas hosts paddleboard cleanups of local rivers leading into the Great Lakes. Last summer, as COVID-19 numbers dropped, they were able to hold a small cleanup in Toronto's Humber River, where it flows into Lake Ontario. Fishing for trash from their paddle boards, they pulled out from the water everything from tin cans to tires. But when it comes to surfing the Great Lakes, it's all about those cold weather months. I'm out here surfing because this is the time that we get to surf. Um, Great Lakes surf season is in the winter because um, we depend on the storms and the winds and stuff, so we're out when we can be out. I would safely say this is a hardcore thing to do. Uh, surfing in January is not for everybody. You do get cold, you can probably see I'm shaking a little bit, but when you love something and it's just like so much fun and it really gets you through the winter, it's worth it. For more on winter recreation, go to greatlakesnow.org. Now, I want to introduce a new series in the show, each month, we'll take you around the lakes to hear from reporters about stories and issues they're covering, bite-sized news briefs about the lakes you love. We're calling it The Catch. And in this installment, we'll get updates on stories tied to Lake Michigan. Benton Harbor, Michigan's water crisis has been national news for months. Leonard Fleming of the Detroit News has been covering Benton Harbor's water problems for over a year. Benton Harbor has been experiencing uh, high levels of lead in its drinking water system. Uh, for three years, three straight years, the city has had lead exceedances um, that have violated the lead and copper rule in the state of Michigan, as well as nationally, the federal lead and copper rule. Governor Whitmer last year pledged to raise funds to replace every single lead service line in Benton Harbor by the spring of 2023. They have replaced upwards of about 450 pipes. They expect there are 3,900 pipes left in the city, lead service lines. Um, so uh, the uh, city and state recently hired five contractors to finish the pipe replacement. And that's a difficult task because number one, the state has not raised all the funds needed. They raised about 18.5 million for a project that is expected to cost uh, a little under or over $33 million. Uh, and the price of copper has been rising due to the pandemic. 
Escalating costs and the state's slow response to the crisis have some in Benton Harbor doubting this new aggressive plan for water safety. I don't expect the residents anytime soon to trust the drinking water in Benton Harbor. Uh, the numerous people I've interviewed for uh, over a year now uh, have continually told me that they simply have lost trust. I think what this story illustrates for the long term is uh, certainly the crumbling infrastructure that we see all across America, but also combining that with the environmental racism that uh, has existed in this situation in Benton Harbor, because this is an, a predominantly black city that's poor and uh, hasn't had the financial resources to get rid of these pipes uh, and to make the drinking water safer there. So the funds that are coming from the federal and state governments uh, to replace these pipes is certainly going to create a safer situation. But some will say that it's, it's a little too late uh, in regards to uh, letting the infrastructure in a city like Benton Harbor go on for so long uh, where the drinking water became unsafe and became national news. At Indiana Dunes National Park on the south shore of Lake Michigan, Joseph S. Pete has been following the shifting sands of the dunes themselves, specifically Mount Baldy, the tallest dune in the park. What I've been covering is the inward migration of Mount Baldy. It is a towering dune on the east side of the park. It's the tallest. Uh, it's near Michigan City. It's about 126 feet high. The dune has been moving inland at about five feet to 15 feet per year to the point where it entirely consumed the access road leading out of the parking lot. It swallowed a picnic area, a significant amount of tall oak trees that ended up creating these sinkholes. In 2013, it was closed off to the public for several years because it swallowed a boy who was hiking up there. The sand had gone over the top of the trees and the trees eventually disintegrated, leaving behind these cavities that are now dangerous sinkholes that the National Park Service has mapped out. But you're not allowed to climb up there on your own anymore. It has to be on a ranger guided tour because people can fall into the, uh, the sinkholes. Officials recently announced new fees for entering the park, which could help pay to replace the facilities Mount Baldy has swallowed up. That's going to raise $750,000 a year, estimated, to bring, to help with park maintenance projects. One of the things they're potentially going to have to do is relocate the parking lot to Mount Baldy, which is also a popular beach area, and potentially relocate trails and other infrastructure. In Interlochen, Michigan, Interlochen Public Radio has released a special season of their Points North podcast called Unnatural Selection. Dan Wanshura is IPR's program director and co-hosts Points North. In this series, we look at sort of the benefits and um, consequences of humans manipulating the natural world. When you look at humans, we impact the natural world like no other species sometimes for the betterment, sometimes for the worse. So some of the things we talk about in unnatural selection in regards to the Great Lakes, Lake Michigan in particular, have to do with removing dams on a lot of rivers. It's been seen as a generally good thing to remove dams and restore rivers to their natural state. But we're encountering a new problem now because dams block certain invasive species from traveling up waterways. So that's a topic. We also deal with shoreline hardening and how the Great Lakes shoreline are constantly eroding. So even when we try to build things to stabilize our property, our land, it's, it's still a losing battle. And then the final thing that deals directly with Lake Michigan is the idea of a frankenfish. Lake trout has been on life support in Lake Michigan for many years, and the population is dependent on stocking from breeding efforts. So we look at this idea of if we have the lake trout genome, could that somehow be used to create a hardier species in Lake Michigan with the lake trout? Nothing is imminent with us creating this, this frankenfish, but because the uh, lake trout genome was, the reference genome was, was cracked recently, we wanted to take it one step further, sort of have that forward outlook and say, what if we could isolate, you know, why certain lake trout species do better than others? And could you somehow 
create lake trout that had a better chance of surviving in Lake Michigan. Um, and it sort of begs that question of like, if you have the technology, does that mean you should do it? We cover a lot of ground in unnatural selection. And I would say what I hope people get from it, take from it is just the, um, the role that we as humans play on the natural world and the impact that we have when we make decisions uh, regarding the management of natural resources. Thanks for watching. For more on these stories and the Great Lakes in general, visit greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. See you out on the lakes. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. The Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. The Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at DPTV. The Polk Family Fund, Eve and Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, Founders Brewing Company, and viewers like you. Thank you.